Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala eşrafil enbiyai vel mursalin. Ala nebiyyina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. Esselamu aleykum ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuh. Welcome to another episode about Islamic legal maxims, al-qawaid al-fiqhiyya. The subject of today's episode will be darurat, tubih al-mahdurat, which means necessities render the prohibited permissible. And this is a subsidiary of the major maxim, al-mashakkatu tajdibu taysir hardship begets facility. As we mentioned in an earlier episode, hardship is of two levels. One is darura and one is haja. So today we'll be talking about darura, which is the most extreme level of hardship. These are needs which when they're disrupted, they create unbearable difficulty. If they happen in a society, it leads to widespread chaos and the disruption of normal life. And when it happens to an individual in particular, then life becomes unbearable. Because this principle allows for the relaxation of normally strict rules, then there have to be parameters for it to be applied according to the intention of the lawgiver. The lawgiver provided these ruchas. Ruchas is a, a relaxation of a normal strict rule. And the Prophet ﷺ in one hadith, he mentioned that Allah loves that people may avail themselves of the dispensations, the ruchas that Allah has provided them, but also we're not supposed to transgress. So you know, what are these parameters that we have to observe in applying this maxim? First of all, as we mentioned in another episode, the necessity must be present and not just anticipated. So an example from classical times was people are on a ship, they're sailing in the ocean, and they see really dark clouds on the horizon and they're coming towards the ship. So they know that a really big storm is going to hit them. So the people who run the ship, they can't just start taking passengers' belongings and throwing them overboard because if the storm hits them and it becomes necessary at that point to get rid of some of the weight on the boat in order for everybody to survive, then it becomes lawful for them to do that, but not when it's just a maybe. Now one of the examples that we discussed, we're doing a book on this in the institute where I work, we discussed an example that one of our researchers had suggested. We discussed it at considerable length because the issue was very much, I mean, controversial. To what extent is the danger present. The whole issue of overpopulation and the great numbers of people using resources, degrading those resources to a point where the planet will no longer be able to sustain the number of human beings at the current level. Now, there are signs of degradation of the environment all over the place. You know, the glaciers are melting everywhere, the ice caps are melting. Most Climate scientists agree that this is due to human impact upon the environment, the burning of fossil fuels in particular. The fish stocks in the ocean are being decimated by overfishing. There are various signs of environmental distress all over the place. But does this allow a government to step in and say, you know what? You can't have any more children to people who have you know, three or four. And this is a situation that people in India, I'm sure, are familiar with, where the government at one point was sterilizing people without their knowledge, without their consent. And of course, that created a massive backlash because 
these are fundamental human rights, you know, the right to reproduce, the right to choose those issues. So at this point in time, is this an impending necessity, a darura, which is still in the future, or is it something which is upon us? Does the situation warrant government stepping in to interfere with people's private choices about how many children they will have? And when phrased in that way, I mean, I agreed with my colleagues that governments are not justified in stepping in on that level. The second parameter for how this principle works is that the period of the relaxation lasts only as long as that pressing need is existent. So if you have a need that comes into existence and that triggers the relaxation of a normal rule, that need continues for a period and then you know, the situation changes and the need disappears. As soon as it disappears, then the permission also disappears with it and the rule returns back to its original status. The normal status is that the act is prohibited. And because of that being an important principle, jurists have actually mentioned a separate maxim for it. It says, مَا أُبِيحَ لِلْدَرُورَةِ بَطَلَ بِزَوَالِهَا Anything permitted due to the existence of darura will cease once it has passed. Okay, and then another parameter is that there should be no lawful alternative to the prohibited means that a person is using in order to deal with this crisis situation. So if you have a lawful means to still satisfy your need, you can't say, you know, I'm forced to use these unlawful means, which is pretty straightforward and clear. If there are a number of prohibited options and there are no lawful options in dealing with a situation and there's a number of prohibited options and the seriousness of the prohibition differs between option A and option B, then the less serious prohibition is the one that should be chosen in that circumstance. Also, you sometimes need expert consideration in order to determine whether a situation has reached the level where the prohibited becomes permissible. Now, a classic example of that is morphine. There are certain you know, operations and certain illnesses where obviously for an operation you would normally need anesthetic. There are certain illnesses which are critical and you're going to die from it like certain kinds of cancer, they're incredibly painful. In those situations, a doctor would be needed to say, okay, this person is at a level of suffering where they need morphine and this is the amount that they need. Sometimes when a situation is one of public necessity, then in those contexts, in that kind of a situation, then the entity which would decide whether this is a situation that requires resorting to prohibited means, that would be the government. It's not up to private individuals in those situations to make those judgment calls. And there are certain prohibited acts which you just can't do under any circumstances due to necessity. For instance, you want to kill somebody to save your life. If the person attacks you, that's something else. And the Prophet ﷺ, he was asked about somebody who wants to take the person's money. He said, defend yourself. Don't give him the money. He said, he's going to fight me. He said, well, if defend yourself. He says, what happens if he kills me? He said, you'll go to paradise. What happens if I kill him? He'll go to the fire. So in that situation, that's not what we're talking about here. Let's say that a person, I mean, this kind of thing happened in 
some of these concentration camps, like in the Bosnian War, a person is given a choice. Kill that person or I will kill you. In that situation, he's not allowed to kill that person. He has to be patient and accept that he's going to die. Okay, we'll take a break and we'll come back and show Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back. Okay, we're talking about the parameters of applying this principle that pressing need becomes a reason for the relaxation or the permissibility of normally prohibited acts. And there are certain prohibited acts which you just can't do under any circumstances due to necessity. For instance, you want to kill somebody to save your life. If the person attacks you, that's something else. And the Prophet he was asked about somebody who wants to take the person's money. He said, defend yourself. Don't give him the money. He said, he's going to fight me. He said, well, if defend yourself. He says, what happens if he kills me? He said, you'll go to paradise. What happens if I kill him? He'll go to the fire. So in that situation, that's not what we're talking about here. Let's say that a person, I mean, this kind of thing happened in some of these concentration camps, like in the Bosnian War person is given a choice. Kill that person or I will kill you. In that situation, he's not allowed to kill that person. He has to be patient and accept that he's going to die. And now we look at the implications of darura with regard to the rule. When you have these very pressing needs, what it means for the person in that situation is that that act, which is normally unlawful, for that person it becomes lawful during that time. 